Um, good morning. Thank you, guys. Appreciate you being here. Um, thank you all for being here. I want to start out by reading something. Uh, this was an op-ed that appeared in the New York Times in 2012. To be clear, running a 9.8 or faster, winning the 100-meter breaststroke, or winning the Tour de France are all very possible and have been done without doping. But it is also clear that winning isn't possible if anti-doping regulations aren't enforced. If you just said no when the anti-doping regulations weren't enforced, then you were deciding to end your dream because you could not be competitive. It's the hard facts of doping. The choice to kiss your childhood dream goodbye or live with a dishonest heart is hard and tearing. I've been there and I know. I chose to lie over killing my dream. I chose to dope. Jonathan, why'd you write that? Well, I mean, I think one, because it's, it's true. Um, two, I think uh, there's a, well, I would say we as a society tend to very much focus on, especially, you know, in America, and, and this isn't to be nationalistic by any standpoint, but in, I would say, more puritanical societies, we tend to focus on that's the ethical decision that this athlete made, and they are 100% responsible. And while that's true, um, I think that we tend to forget uh, in these equations where these athletes came from. You know, one of the best examples right now is, you know, in Russia. Um, you know, Russian athletes, I lived with a household full of Russian athletes when I first started my professional cycling career. Um, they doped. They all doped. And to them, it wasn't a moral or ethical question. It was simply, I'm taking the medicine that I'm being given by my coach, by my mentor, by my doctor, so on and so forth. And as someone coming from you know, suburban America that went to church on Sundays and so on and so forth, you live in that environment for three years, you see a huge group of people basically making that choice without having to debate in their head whether this is right or not. And little by little, it tears you down. And little by little, you realize that the dream that you gave everything up for, and you have to understand in professional cycling, you give everything up for this dream. When you say, I want to be a professional cyclist, it means you're going to forego college. It means you're going to move to Europe at a very young age. It means you're going to lose social connections. You're going to lose job opportunities. You're in this 100%. If you do not succeed in this venture, you're, you know, you're going to be in a world of hurt. You're going to come back to your life at 25, 26 years old as sort of a broken person that doesn't really have any true employment opportunities. You go all in to become a professional cyclist. And when you're watching the cultural environment around you, and I only say Russia because it's topical right now and that I happen to have a you know, connection to the beginning of my career when I lived with this household of Russians. When you watch the culture around you dictate that, no, it, in their opinion, the right decision was to dope, it, little by little it wears you down, it wears you down. And what we do in the puritanical society is to blame the individual, demonize the individual, and we don't look at it from a systemic standpoint. We say, why didn't all these guys say no? Well, I can tell you all my teammates, these Russian guys, they didn't say no because it, they never even thought it was a bad thing. They never, I mean, it just wasn't, it was the only decision. It was the correct decision. It was the decision that they were being told to do by the people around them. And so, you know, eventually, when you're in your late teens and early 20s, I'm sure a lot of you can relate to this, when you're around a certain environment long enough, you say, okay, well, I guess that's the right decision. And even though in the back of your head you might not think that's really true, you get worn down by it. So I just wanted to put like a personal, like this is how this happens. So if, if you're making the distinction or the, or the observation that sometimes different cultures, different sports don't make look at right and wrong differently. Um, Gretchen, I'm curious, in your world of snowboarding, which some would describe not only as a sport, but a lifestyle, 
Um, and some, so often people say, well, we know what those boarders are like. You know, They're out getting high, and then they get on their boards, and they go for a ride. When you were competing, um, did people look at the difference of right and wrong when it came to using drugs, whether recreational or those to perhaps enhance their performance? Snowboarding, um, <laughs> snowboarding, I, things are changing. Um, you know, sports evolve. But snowboarding, the original spirit of snowboarding didn't come from, it wasn't even, a, it wasn't a sport. It wasn't a sport in the beginning. It, it was a fad. It wasn't allowed on most mountain resorts around the world. And snowboarding really started sort of as a, a rebellion against traditional sports that were about winning and that were about being in the Olympics and that were about doping. Um, it, it was sort of a re rebellion to, to en enjoy ourselves, to slide down a mountain, to en enjoy what that feeling is like, to do it in a creative way. It wasn't about how fast can I get down the mountain. For some people it was. But for others it was how can I get down the mountain and use the terrain to creatively ride and 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 really like surf surf this mountain and so when I first started snowboarding I had I already said I, I always wanted to be an Olympian so it was this really interesting sort of contrast um, but I started snowboarding because I love that it wasn't about this linear path to become the best and even though that's all I mean I wanted to be an Olympic a, Olympian, so I, I kind of had to wrap my head around all of this. But ultimately, I chose snowboarding um, before, far before it was even considered a sport, and it was inducted into the Winter Olympics. Um, when it was in '98, that's when I said I want to go to the Olympics for snowboarding. Um, so I think the original spirit of snowboarding w was something very different. And now we're running into this issue where we have bigger, we have popularity. I think the reason people are drawn to snowboarding in the Olympics is because it was so different. You had people celebrating one another who were each other's biggest competitors. And people said, is that real? Is that really real or is this just a show? Yes, this is real. My best friend is my biggest competitor. And we got to travel around the world together as a family and enjoy a sport that we loved. But ultimately, what's happening now in snowboarding is we have bigger sponsors, we have more pressure, we have more money, and it's creating the effect of this isolation. Athletes believe that, you know, I have all of this pressure put on me, I have this big sponsor, I have to win the Olympics, so, you know, maybe I should train differently, maybe I shouldn't train with my best friend who's my biggest competitor because that might sh mean that she has a chance of winning and I won't you know, this lack mentality. So um, it, it's, it's an interesting evolution. And, you know, snowboarding in the beginning, the first 98 Olympics, Ross, uh, I always forget the, how to say his last name, but uh, Ribagliati um, was, you know, he was found to have weed in his system and, was, you know, had his medal taken away. I think eventually they gave that back to him because at the time it wasn't a banned, uh, banned substance. Um, but it, I mean, it was the exact opposite of, you know, doping. Uh, he was enjoying himself smoking weed. So it, it's such a different, it's such a different experience. But I see now my sport becoming um, closer and closer to what cycling has to deal with. And it's, it's a really interesting subject because I think what a lot of people also don't realize is this, the difference between banned substances and doping. And what is the difference? But then when you start to talk about this, um, you just start to talk about technology and the, the will of human beings to go bigger and, and um, be stronger and fly higher. And lots of times that has to do with technology, whether it's the bikes you're riding or the snowboards or the supplements that you're taking.
Well, I guess people can define performance enhancing in many different ways. We've talked about even weightlifting is performance enhancing to some degree. Um, Jonathan, when you started and helped co-found Slipstream, and you were the first cycling team that worked with and cooperated with WADA, the World Anti-Doping Association Agency, um, do you, was the purpose to affect change and across the board for everybody to say, wait a minute, we can do this differently? Yeah, I mean, that, that, was, that was the primary focus. I mean, end of the day, if you start out and say, okay, we're going to um, sort of index the biological passport testing and we're going to attempt to race clean and, and so on and so forth, and the environment around you doesn't change, then you survive a year or two. Uh, and then, you know, and then you're gone um, because, y you know, you just, you won't get results. You won't, um, you know, you won't, you won't, per you won't be able to, you know, earn your place in the top tier of cycling, so on and so forth. So you actually, uh, there had to be a degree of success in changing, you know, the course of the whole sport because without that, um, there was actually no chance of, of, of the team existing for any, any period of time. Um, interestingly, at that point in time in the sport, it was a real right moment because sort of that movement was already underway. There had been, there had been enough scandals um, to pressurize the environment to move that direction. So if you sort of stood up on top of a building and started yelling, you know, real loudly, that's the direction we think we can go, and people see that from a, you know, sponsorship standpoint, you're talking about bigger and bigger sponsors, that the sponsors say, okay, well, you know, we think that's the direction to go to. Then all of a sudden, from a very pragmatic standpoint, even teams or individual riders or, you know, the, the governing bodies, so on and so forth, the, the culture around the entire sport starts to say, well, wait a minute, you know, these guys are, are doing it contrary to what the sport has been for a hundred years. And it seems to be working uh, you know, w why don't we do it that way too? Because, you know, we're going to have a better reputation. Uh, the sponsors are going to appreciate this more. It's a, you know, it's not only uh, the correct ethical decision, it's also correct business decision. And we did see that turn in cycling where the decisions um, were made by a lot of people who potentially, you know, would have been really skeptical or highly involved in doping or whatever years before that they chose, okay, you know, listen, game's up, let's do a different direction. This is better for everyone. And I think, uh, y you know, y y you have to do it that way or else, you know, the success of one clean athlete in a sea of athletes that are doping, it, it's, that person's never gonna have a voice. They're, it's never going to change anything. It's just gonna be washed away. So you kinda have to, you have to come at it from the stance of, we got to change the whole thing. It's sort of an all or nothing proposition. Gretchen, most people advocate change, most, um, although we all know that cheating is not going to go away, whether it's on Wall Street or any other business or in sports. Did the IOC miss an opportunity when it came to dealing with the Russian team for these Olympics in Rio? Do you think they, they swung and they missed? You know, I mean, really, I'm going to answer that question in a roundabout way because it's it's not it's not Russia, it's not the athletes, it's 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 a society problem where we are focused on the end result, we're focused on medals, we're focused on winning, and we've gotten out of control. And really, I think it's a huge perspective shift around why are we competing in sports? Why do we love the Olympics? These bigger questions around why are we even doing what we're doing? And yes, it is about seeing human potential and breaking down barriers of ideas of what's possible. But at the end of the day, and it sounds cliche because it is, but it's the truth. It's the, it's the reason it's a cliche is that this journey of realizing what you're capable of is the point. And it's not something any of us talk about enough. It's not something the media focuses on. It's not something that the athletes are helped to understand. It's not something that the sponsors support. This idea of every single day, I enjoy a sport, hopefully, um, 
that I love and every single day I get to push past my own boundaries and ideas of what's possible and tap into my full potential. And through this experience, I'm becoming more fully a person in this world who, who has bigger ideas of what the world is and can raise awareness around social change. You know, this journey, instead of focusing on the end result, because ultimately the end result is not sustainable. What is sustainable is this journey and, and looking at it and celebrating it and not just celebrating the medal. And that is a, that's a society shift. And I don't believe it's all about the athletes. I believe that it's, it's about athletes, it's about sponsors, it's about the fans, it's about the, the organizations that run it all. We're all responsible. So it's not about Russia. Should we not then try to control what people, what substances they use and take to enhance their performance? I think you gotta get to the source problem. That is not the source problem. But as, as somebody said, it's, and maybe it was Chris Clue who said, it's human nature to try and cheat. So do we just decide that we should let people do what they wanna do? I mean, can we really make a I think people shift? are going to do what they want to do. And I think the more we celebrate why we're really doing what we're doing, and it's not about this end result, it's not about the fame and the glory, and the more people you have talking about who've experienced this, of it wasn't about the fame and the glory. It was actually about discovering what I was capable of and then going and using that power in society in a way that's truly meaningful and fulfilling. And... That's just a shift. Jonathan, when you started Slipstream, you made a concerted effort to test your athletes on a pretty regular basis. I forget how often you were, you were taking blood tests from them. How intrusive did they find that practice? I mean, it's incredibly intrusive. Um, it's something that, <laughs> that luckily very few people uh, out there ever have to experience. I mean, uh, constantly having you know, blood drawn and constantly watching or having somebody watch you go to the bathroom. I mean, it's, it's not, you know, at all hours of the day uh, or night. Um, no, it's, 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 not, it's not fun for anyone. But at the same point in time, um, if you want to boil down to why do we, what's the purpose of holding a sporting competition? That's a question to you. I think people have um, different ideas of why they hold sporting events. All right. Well, if you go you back say? to the uh, if you go back to the original idea of why we should all be healthy and participate in athletics, it was it was to be healthy and to be active. Okay, but why would you hold a competition then? Well, you want to see who's best. Right. You want to see who's best. So, fundamentally, if we completely sort of deregulate uh, sports and just say, well, okay, let's not even try uh, with anti-doping. You, you could also say, let's not even try with penalties in the NFL. Let's just let them go at it. You know, let's just eliminate rules, you know, put some basic framework and see who smashes the other person. Um, let them rough the punter. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and that's the equivalent is if you, if you don't, then how do you determine who was the best? Because if the whole point is, well, you know, this person was the most talented, and this person used their talent by training, you know, the best, they were the smartest regarding uh, strategy, so on and so forth, then that person would be determined the best. If you're introducing this X factor that's outside of the rules, um, whether it be doping or whether it be roughing the kicker, then all of a sudden you, it, it muddles the, the answer of who's best. So then the point is, is, well, why are we doing this at all? You know, then, then let's just call it entertainment and, you know, we, we can just have sporting events in Las Vegas and, and just be done with it. I mean, that's, um, I, th I think that's sort of the answer as to why you try. Is it always going to be successful? No. But that doesn't mean you stop trying. I, I want to get to... Can I quickly sure. just touch Jump on that? Because um, I do believe that we should be drug tested, but I think a lot of people, what a lot of people also don't realize is in being drug tested, because I had to be drug tested every year for 15 years, literally had to send in my quarterly report form where every three months I had to tell them where I was and they could come and drug test me at any moment, whether it was urine sample or blood. And 
what a lot of people don't know, and this is what I was sort of bringing up around banned su substances, is that as an athlete, we hold our athletes to this really, really, you know, tremendous point where we want them to be the best, and yet they're also not allowed to take supplements like vitamin C. If, if, if I was starting to feel rundown because I've been traveling and I've been competing and I feel like my immune system is getting weak, I want to take a supplement to help combat that. Um, banned substances, you are only limited to certain substances that have been approved by, you know, in, in, in the US, the United States Anti-Doping Association, Association. So I'm the type of person that likes alternative therapy. So I like uh, Chinese medicine and, and these things that cannot be, cannot be verified with USADA um, whether they would be banned or not banned. And so I was told, you know, if you're starting to feel sick, you gotta just stick with this very streamlined supplement line. And so as an athlete that I'm supposed to be the best, I'm not allowed to use the supplements that work best for my body. And that this is this gray line that, you know, it well, well to, to that point, at Real Sports, we did a story about this, and Zach Lund, who's an Olympic luger, um, was disqualified because he was taking Propecia for losing his hair. And it turned out that there was a chemical component to that, which, which made him uh, ineligible for the Olympics. And I want to talk to you, Gretchen, a little bit more about what it's like to be subjected to this doping. Do we have the video? Can we roll that? Is that hard to get up? I don't know. Do you need a minute? Because I right don't now you know don't know where this athlete is, or this is what's this is going to tell you where he is, or he, he or she. Well, you know, the night before I print out his whereabouts file. So Scott Lowell, a doping control officer in the Boston area, is one of seventy around the country. His task this early Saturday morning is to collect a sample from an elite rower named Alex Zosels. How will he find him? Believe it or not, the top 3,000 Olympic athletes in the United States have to tell the doping agency exactly where they're going to be, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. No exceptions. So we know where he is, but he has no idea that you're coming this morning. No, he's got no idea. Okay. No. It's not exactly breakfast in bed, but Lowell and his wife Deb are at least together. When he goes out for a drug test, she joins him as a chaperone. A little banging. Come on, Alex. So you, you've been knocking for a couple minutes. Yeah. No answer. No answer. Okay, so now what's your obligation here in terms of waiting him out? Well, we have uh, 60 minutes we have to stay at this location. Not being where you told the agency you'd be can be a big problem for an athlete. Do that three times in 18 months, and you could face up to a two-year ban. So now the protocol... Oh. Hi. Alex Zosel's fiance had been sleeping soundly in their loft above the boathouse while Alex was out for a bike ride. The drug testers must wait for Alex to return. And 25 minutes later, he did. You've been selected for out-of-competition testing. There's your notification letter. Zosuls is 33, a scientist at Boston University. And driver's license. Okay, driver's license. Uh, passport work? Passport works. Okay, As ahead. the athlete gets his passport, Lowell's wife keeps an eye on him. Zosuls goes through the exact same process any potential Olympian would. Items to declare. Use of a glucocorticosteroids in the last three months. Nope. Use he answers questions areas. about medications and supplements he's taking and declares even the use of a simple cold remedy. What's the dose on that? One, like two days ago or something. All right. Now it's up to you. Mm -hmm. All right. Alex agreed to let us film the moment of truth. Lowell is required to witness and have an unobstructed view. You had 90? So 150 almost. Oh, we're good. The protocol is crystal clear. The athlete chooses and inspects the bottles into which he and only he must pour the urine. Two bottles, 
So there has to be enough urine for an A sample and a backup B sample. You're going to do a series of clicks as far as you can clockwise and then try and go backwards a click and forwards a click. Watch your arms. I'm afraid you're going to knock over bottle A and we're going to start this process all over again. Just, just, we've, we've practiced a lot of times. Yes. This, so. <laughs> this in our sleep. This is serious business it, to you. It is serious business. You know, it's, uh, you know, we're talking about his, his, his sport, you know, hit him as an athlete, you know, his, his accomplishments. And, you know, we want to make sure that we're doing the right thing here. Well, we're here to protect uh, the rights of clean athletes. Well, everybody was laughing. <laughs> but I'm so glad you shared that because my, my husband and mom are over here laughing because they experienced this with me. I mean, literally 15 years of that. That's what drug testing is. They were knocking on the door. Um, is that what sport has come to? That we have to monitor 24-7, 365 around the globe in order to make sure it's fair, in order to determine, Jonathan, as you said, who's the best. I mean, if you want to know the answer to that question, yeah. That, that is, I mean, it's just a matter of, you know, sports in general have become extremely monetized. They become extremely high pressure. Um, and the avenues of skirting the regulations um, become more creative with every passing moment. And so if you want to, if you want to answer the question, who's the best, fundamentally, you, you have to figure out how to enforce the rules within the confines of the rules. Or at least, you know, try your hardest. As we watch these Olympics, we watch the finger wagging, we watch the finger pointing, we watch the naming of other athletes. Um, can we ever move beyond this? What does the future hold for dealing with these types of things? Because as Lance pointed out, when you talk about genetic manipulation and such, once the labs are open for business and the whole playing field changes for what we can do, you know, once we realize we could clone and such, how do we stop it? I mean, that, that's a probably a better question for a scientist than, than, than myself. But I, I mean, I think, you know, it's essentially, I mean, again, I think we have to figure out as a society, um, what we want out of sports. I mean, that, that's the first question. Because until you answer that, if, if the answer is we just want pure entertainment, um, that we're, we're, we just kind of want to watch the game and we're not, uh, we're not curious, we're not interested in, in, the, in, the, in you know, the question of answering the question, who is the best? Uh, and we're more curious to just see who wins. Um, then, yeah, you, you kind of say, you know, well, the technology of anti-doping is, is never going to catch up, so let's just throw up our hands and forget about it. Conversely, if you want to answer that question of who's the best and not just, you know, who's going to win, but both, um, then you basically have to, you have to pursue the technology of genetic engineering, of doping. You've got to pursue it just as hard as people are pursuing uh, ways to manipulate it. You know, I think from a sociological standpoint, a lot of what Gretchen said about, you know, we need to back up and think about sports as what's the journey. And, and you know, this is about finding out the best that you can be. I think that's, that's a very important thing for young athletes to hear. Um, it is not... I think, you know, in, in, in a sport like snowboarding, in, in some societal context, that's what's heard. I can tell you from living with a household full of Russian guys, that was never heard by them. This was, you know, they were going to work in the gulag, and if they became a professional cyclist, they were going to earn 300 times the money they would, you know, earn... In, in, a, in, a, in a pretty bad situation. I mean, Russia was obviously in a much worse place in the mid-90s than it is now, but, um, you know, this wasn't, this wasn't a journey for them. This was a job. This was a hard job, and part of that job entailed uh, trying to win. And in professional cycling, 
uh, for better, for worse, and you know, to take this out of just the context of Russia, because I'm, I'm just talking about that again because it's topical and, and because I've got an experience with it, but um, in professional cycling, a large percentage of the guys in that race are, you know, they, they, they aren't even necessarily enjoying it anymore. They, they, it is a, this is a hard career. They started out when they were 12. They've put in hundreds of thousands of miles of training. And at this point in time, they need to get the job done at the end of the day. And all of a sudden, you know, the more ethereal moral questions become much fuzzier. Well, and I, I totally, I believe it. And I, I've seen it myself. I, when I watched Lindsey Vaughn come down from her run in 2010, and she had just won her gold medal, and she started crying and saying, I've sacrificed everything. And I felt so lucky because my whole world of snowboarding, I never felt like I sacrificed. Yes, I didn't go to college. Yes, I did work really hard. I trained. I had to be randomly drug tested at 4 a.m., win, lose, or draw. But at the end of the day, I was doing something that I loved. I was doing something that I believed in, and it was helping me to become a better person. So I think the bottom line is the world could learn a lot from snowboarding. <laughs> I, I, with, with I actually that. agree with that 100%. I think that's correct. Uh, with that, let's open it up to anybody who's got questions out in the audience. Um, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> my name is John Buxbaum. I thought what Jonathan was saying um, early in his career and, and living with the Russians and, you know, to them, it was, it was no question. I mean, it wasn't about right and wrong and because it was, it was part of the system and, and they were being told, whereas, you know, our athletes, you know, it is different, but I think it brings out that the, the structure that you come from and the background is critically important and so, you know, it's, it's different philosophies from, from different parts of the world. But I'm thinking, you know, to your program, that what's amazing to me is what you hear about that goes on in master's competition. So these are people who, you know, there is no money. Um, maybe they think there's glory, but uh, there's not much. But the, the journey that, that Gretchen talks about in recognizing the improvement that you can make, you know, as an athlete and what it means to you. But, you know, the, the theory is there's a lot of doping that goes on in master's competition. And, you know, I think that's just, if that becomes a bigger problem, what does it say for, you know, all of the kids coming up and, and everything else? And it's just hard to understand why anybody would want to dope in a master's. It's not your profession. You know, it means nothing at the end of the day other than your self-gratification. But, uh, you know, it seems to be a growing issue, and I just wonder how, mu how much people are paying attention to that. Or maybe not even a question, just a statement. <laughs> well, Jonathan, I, mean, I think it's, you know, oh, sorry, yeah, Masters is uh, guys that are, is it over 35 or over 40? Yeah, oh, yeah but, yeah. Um, guys who are done. <laughs> but it's, these, are, this isn't, a, you know, this isn't uh, exclusively ex-professional athletes. It's, you know, you can go race if you want. You can go, you could dope too. Um, yeah, it's for the most part, yeah. Uh, it, you know, and on the flip side of it, and even more concerningly, down into, you know, into junior ranks. And I think it's, the deal is, is that it's okay, well, this is what the pros are doing. And this is cool. You know, the pros ride a cool bike, and the pros r have these cool shoes, and the pros have it. So, and, y you know, so this is what I'm going to do, too. The other part about it with Masters Racing is I think, you know, we've seen a huge jump in, in these sort of anti-aging clinics, hormone depletion, so on and so forth. And that, y you know, basically the, all of a sudden, going back to your point about supplements, is you know, you've got an anti-aging clinic, you're a 50-year-old guy, you go in and they say, well, you know, you've got low testosterone, you've got low X, Y, Z here, you know, take this, well, wait a minute, now you're doping, and you're thinking, well, no, I just bike race for fun. So there's two things going on in the Masters racing. There's one of sort of that we've all of a sudden made it as a society, you know, okay to, to take hormones, uh, which for most people it obviously is. Um, and two, you know, there's a sort of desire to be more like the pros. And what's really 
sad to me is that, um, you know, that you see the belief in a lot of these guys racing that they, they really think that this is what all the pros are doing. And they aren't, you know, they aren't getting tested once a week and they aren't, you know, subject to all these rules and they aren't, and they, and they don't realize that actually, you know, most of the pros are not. And so then it, it just becomes sort of this sad story of like they're following something that they believe is happening and I, uh, idealizing it, even though it's not accurate, which is, I mean, really disappointing. Yes. Uh, yes, I'm Larry Gelman, and I was just wondering, uh, as someone who has followed sports more than played them most of my life, uh, do you think it would ever come to the point where there would be two separate categories of athletes, the people who are willing to subject themselves to these kinds of exhaust, you know, the clean ones, and then the open division where anything goes and people can just do whatever they want? I'm just going to, because I, that's a great question because I was going to pose that to Gretchen and Jonathan because in a sense that's what bodybuilding has done, right? There's, there's that, the clean, and there are those that everybody knows are on. And motorsports too. <laughs> so anyway, you guys, you guys can address that. I mean, is, is, is there going to come to that one day in the X Games or the Olympics or in cycling that we'll have two different categories? Um. I don't, I don't know how to even answer that. I, I just, um, do you want to go ahead? I'm just going to think about <laughs> no, that for a minute. It's not an easy question <laughs> to answer. I, listen, it, totally possible. Again, it's like we kind of have to decide what we want. I mean, you know, you are all consumers of sports. So what do you want to see? Um, you know, if, if you want to see... Uh, open class racing where, you, you know, it's, it's just it's, it's whatever you want to do, it's, it's fine, go for it. Um, then, you know, probably if that's something that society really wants and is desirous of, then eventually, you know, that'll happen. Um, to me, that's a really, uh, it's a scary prospect to, because, first of all, what about the guy who, you know, s says, oh, I'm going to race the clean category because it's a little bit easier and I'm not going to be clean, okay? So now you already have sort of that problem going on. But secondly, I think fundamentally, uh, you know, in, in sort of, uh, I mean, a lot of the ideas I've talked about are, you know, are, are fairly liberal as to why doping occurs and so on and so forth. But one thing that we tend to forget in this equation is what about that one kid that is the most talented, that is the hardest working, that and, and just loves it, and he is going to be the best and so on and so forth. And he just... You know his moral compass is is absolute. He says no, I don't I don't want to dope. In in your scenario, he's always kind of a sec I mean he might be the winner of the clean category, but in a way he's never going to be the fastest in the world. He's never going to be the best in the world. He's always just kind of like the, you know he's the top of the B race in a way. And you know and if we, and if we keep it the way it is, that kid you know it, it, it stands a chance. Maybe not as much as we'd like, but he stands a chance. And I always feel like that um, one of the biggest mistakes that I made in my career and when I doped was that I did not consider the rights of that kid. I didn't consider his feelings. I didn't consider his dreams. And so, I don't know, I just feel like that scenario kind of cheats that kid out of, out of his dreams. Yes, sir, in the blue. Uh, Dick Kaufman, I have two questions. One, I'd appreciate if you deal with this issue. Did the IOC lose an opportunity uh, in dealing with Russia, um, where doping was state-sponsored and probably required to be in uh, many of their programs? And secondly, um, I, I don't understand the, uh, what doping does. How? to what degree it helps you and how and where it helps you. Uh, would you explain that in several sports, please? Sure. Um, so with the IOC decision on Russia, to start off, first part of your question, it's a real tough one um, because I, I don't know for sure, but I doubt that many of those athletes were given much of an option. Um, and if they were, 
the option to opt out was probably frowned upon by a lot of people around them. So, but what do you do if you're in the IOC? All of a sudden you've got this scandal, you've got a hundred athletes that were clearly doping. How do you deal with that? Even though their voluntary action may have been different. You know, do you ban the federation? Do you ban the individual? Do you ban the country? Um, I mean, it's a rat's nest. Um, although it was a pretty unpopular decision by the IOC, it might not have been totally bad just saying, we're not going to ban the country entirely. We're going to allow individual athletes to go, you know, undergo supplementary testing to prove they're clean before they come to the games. And it's a bit ad hoc, and it should have occurred two years ago as opposed to right, you know, a month before the games. Um, but, you know, Thomas Jefferson always used to say it's, it's, it's better, you know, to let 100 guilty men go free than to imprison one innocent man. And, you know, what about the one Russian athlete that was in, in innocent in that equation and you ban the entire country? So I, 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 I wish I had the answer to that. I, I've actually thought this through my head a million times. I don't, I don't have clarity on what should have been done there. It's just an overall really sad uh, situation. I think that obviously the punitive focus should be on the people that were responsible for that program, um, enforcing the athletes into that. But, you know, those people are protected at a very high government level, so the punitive part isn't going to come to them. And unfortunately, uh, indirect or direct or our perception is, is, is punishing the athletes, which is a little bit sad in this, in this case. Um, Second party question, and this is actually an interesting one. What does doping do? Here's, a, here's the irony of the way sort of modern doping works is that most people think, you know, you take a shot or you take a pill and then whew, you fly right afterwards. You're just off, and off you go and you're 10 miles an hour faster than you were before. The reality of how doping works is actually the doping itself, there is some effect without a doubt, but it's fairly small. The effect of doping in modern um, context is that it allows your body to train more. It allows you to train more and more and more every day and recover from those efforts. So the gains in speed that you're making are actually your own in that they're gained from the effort that you're putting into the sport. The drugs are just simply allowing you to wake up the next morning and not be a zombie. And I think that that's a little bit, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's something a lot of, not a lot of people understand that, that um, you know, as anti-doping regulations become stronger, it makes it harder for the athletes to work as hard as they would because I'll tell you, most guys out there, you know, if, if they knew they could recover, not, not everybody, but a lot of guys out there, I would say, the very determined ones, if they knew they could recover, they'd train 16 hours, 20 hours a day if they knew that they could get up the next morning and do it again. I mean, the, the, you know, the, the guts these guys have is, is unbelievable. The drugs are just sort of allowing them to, to actually live through doing that. I think, do we have, to, we have to stop it there? I'm sorry, we have to let that be the last word. Gretchen, Jonathan, thank you so much for being with thank us. You. Thank you, everybody.